Bé, continuem amb la ponència. Tenim l'honor de presentar la ponència amb el títol Ensorrament i recuperació de l'arxiu històric de la ciutat de Colònia. Repeteixo, tenim l'honor de comptar amb el doctor Ulrich Fischer. Ell faré unes breus pinzellades. És subdirector de l'arxiu històric de la ciutat de Colònia. Des de l'esfondrament de l'arxiu el 2009 s'ha encarregat de la seva reconstrucció. El 2013 també va assumir la direcció del Departament de Fons Documentals Municipals des de l'any que comprenen, des de l'any 1815, així mateix de les polítiques generals de l'arxiu. En aquesta mateixa funció ha participat en la creació de l'arxiu digital de la ciutat de Colònia. És també membre actiu de nombroses iniciatives i grups de treball sobre arxius digitals a nivell local i nacional. És membre de Blue Shield Germany. Darrerament ha iniciat junt amb Nadine Til la fundació de la xarxa d'emergència de Colònia, en la que 25 arxius i biblioteques col·laboren en la gestió de riscos i prevenció de catàstrofes. També ha compartit la seva experiència en tasques de recuperació, com en els incendis del Museu Nacional de Rio de Janeiro i la Biblioteca Universitària de Ciutat del Cap, entre d'altres. Les conseqüències de les inundacions a Alemanya a l'estiu del 2021 han estat la seva experiència més recent en aquest camp. Li donem la paraula. Moltes gràcies. Good morning. Good morning. I, I'll be speaking English, and I uh, heard that you oh, you are all putting in your earphones. So I hope this works. Can I have a sign if this uh, if you can actually understand me? Give me a thumbs up or something. All right. Okay. So the next thing I have to find out is how this works. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you very much first of all for having me um, here talk to you. I feel very honored to be part of this um, 12th laboratory of uh, the Catalan Municipal Archives. And uh, I feel particularly honored because I am here as a representative um, of uh, Twin City of Barcelona. Cologne and uh, Barcelona are twinned. And um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm um, happy to talk to you about a, a subject that is not really um, a positive subject at all. And um, we've heard a lot about the current risks that we are all encountering at the moment um, from uh, cyber crime to wars in Europe, to the pandemic, to climate change, which we are all feeling. It's actually way too warm in Cologne as well at the moment. Um, so, um, I'm talking to you about a risk that has always been there and that will always be there and that is not really associated to the other risk. It's, uh, um, it's the risk of structural failure of a building. I never thought I would have to talk about that before 2009, but here we are. And um, I've been asked to talk about um, what has happened, but also to talk about what we have learned. And we are very, very willing to share our experiences um, with you and with the archive community uh, because we have encountered such a lot of solidarity from the archive community after the collapse of the archives. Um, so that, um, yes, we are very, very willing to share all of that. So I'll take you first to my archive and to the fateful date of the 3rd of March 2009. Um, first of all, as respects the um, Cologne City Archives, we pride ourselves on being the biggest municipal archive north of the Alps. And I, I'm quite certain this does not apply uh, in all respects, but we are still a fairly big municipal archive and we are north of the Alps, so um, that should uh, that should be all right. Uh, we have about documents from about 1,000 years. The oldest charters are from the 10th century. And um, 
by the time the collapse happened, we had about 30 shelf kilometers of material, about 60,000 charters and diplomas, um, several hundred thousand photographs, large format items, and so on. And also uh, fonts of personal papers. And I always put Heinrich Böll, who is um, a writer from Cologne, actually he won the Nobel Prize in uh, actually 50 years ago, 1972. Um, but there are lots of others um, from the area, politicians, um, architects, and so on. Just a, a little bit about the chronology. Um, uh, in the Middle Ages, there used to be an archive chest which contained all the privileges uh, the city had uh, at that point of time. And in the 15th century, um, the town council decided to build um, a tower on the town hall and they moved all the material there. Um, in the 1850s, to make a very big jump in chronology, um, there was the first professional archivist in Cologne. Um, and then the material in the archive had survived until then. There was no major fire, thankfully. Uh, all the Middle Ages and so on, no major fire, so it wasn't hurt. And when the Second World War began in 1939, um, it was all evacuated very early on. And so there was also no losses then. Uh, in 1971, it was moved to the building you see at the bottom right. Now, I know it's not a very beautiful building, but it was, it was okay for, uh, for uh, what we used it for. And this is the building that collapsed in 2009. And in 2021, we moved to the present building, which you can see on the left. So and this is what the same building, the one on the right, looked like on the 3rd of March. They were building an underground line in front of the um, archive building and uh, at some point of time uh, there was um, something happened to this building site so that a lot of material from way below the archive moved into um, a, a, a hollow area and uh, in the end it was 5,000 cubic meters of material that was moved below ground and so there was nothing underneath the archive and the archive just collapsed and you can see that here. This is actually done by our fire brigade. Um, what happened was that uh, in the middle, this building would just break in two parts and then it sort of twisted and fell in the street. Um, unfortunately, two young people died in the neighboring house on, on, the, on the left. Um, they were on the top floor and they had no chance of um, getting out because all of this happened very, very quickly. Uh, fortunately, all the people who were in the archives um, could be evacuated just in time. The last people left and there was, was already the facade coming down. So we were very lucky in that respect. Um, some houses uh, around um, the archive building also had to be torn down. And uh, as you can see in the right picture, there was just a big heap of rubble in the street. It looked like war. It looked like uh, pictures that we don't want to see but that uh, you see at the moment from Ukraine, this is what it looked like in the middle of Cologne. Um, not everything was looking like stratified, like in this picture. This is a very helpful area because you at least, you, you can tell the, the different stories, but um, most of it was just in a big rubble on the street and in a hole. So that was um, uh, about, two o'clock in the afternoon on the 3rd of March uh, 2009. What did we do? Um, evacuation began right before a collapse. The fire department was alerted also at the time that the building was actually collapsing. And they started by declaring a major catastrophic event. Um, they convened a crisis group, uh, emergency action began, and we were extremely lucky that the fire chief of Cologne was also an avid user of the archives because he was very interested in the history of the fire department in Cologne. So he and all his um, people knew that this was actually an important building, not just an ugly building in the, in the Severin Street, but actually an important building containing very important material. Um, and uh, he went there, he brought every every man he could find in the city, they were brought there, huge numbers of fire cars piling up in the street everywhere. And they were, of course, expecting that there were very, very many casualties. As I said, they were just um, 
the, the two young men and they could not be found because their bodies had been torn. Um, one of them was nine meters underground, the other one was about 15 meters below ground. So it's a huge, um, huge disaster. Um, nevertheless, of course, numerous people were traumatized. Um, several buildings, as I said, had to be torn down. Um, there's um, one school across the road and another school behind the building. Both of them had to be evacuated. There's a retirement home that had to be evacuated very quickly. Um, and then um, we found, of course, we found out that almost all of the archive collection, uh, we thought at that point of time was, dam was lost. We found out later it was damaged. And uh, an expert in the end came up with a figure of uh, 627 million euros as the costs for um, reconstructing the archive collections. The building of the metro line was um, delayed by several years. Now it's actually, it still has not been finished and it's going to be another six or seven years. It's uh, amazing. And there have been, of course, extensive lawsuits, both criminal cases as regards to um, the, um, the people who are actually working there and also there has been civil litigation uh, against the companies. So at that point of time, of course, we did not care about um, litigation and lawsuits. Um, we just tried to move material out and you can see fire pit from the fire brigade. Um, they are carrying out uh, the charters from, um, from a part of the building that was not completely destroyed. So they could get in and they carried them out. Most of the building or most of the archive material was in the rubble that looked like this. And of course it was dangerous to work in there. So no archivists or conservators were allowed there. This was just a matter that the fire brigade and other uh, agencies of that kind would do. So they'd be like with their hands picking out the paper and putting it into those um, cardboard boxes and then bringing it to um, archivists and volunteers who'd be uh, doing the next work. And this continued for about six months until all the rubble had been cleared. You can see here that some of it was actually very spectacular. They, um, fairly early on, um, we, we had um, a roof built, so uh, we didn't have trouble with, um, uh, with water and rain at that point of time. But of course it was still very dangerous, so the fire department brought in specialists who would be going down from above. Uh, I've never seen that before. And uh, the right picture on the right hand side, you see um, other people's not firefighters, but it's from a different agency. They are working underground already in the, in the area that was built for the, for the underground line. Now I said we did that for six months. We brought out about 85% of the material, but we knew there's more and the rest of it would be down below water level. So it's um, under the groundwater level and um, there had to be buildings put up, especially uh, to salvage that. And this was done, as you can see, with divers. Um, and it took about two more years, but we got out about another 10% of the material. And I was quite surprised, and I'm, I'm very happy to be able to work with paper, because I found out paper is so sturdy. It's really amazing. We um, took out files after two years in groundwater and you could still file through them, you could leave through them, they were okay, you could read it. So amazing material, I think we are all very happy that we can work with that kind of material. So what's the scope of the effort in total? Um, we had to salvage, treat and store about 27 shelf kilometer of damaged material. We had 100,000 large, several hundred thousand large format items and about half a million um, photos to deal with. We have, of course, a large number of fragmented items. So we have to deal with that as well. I'm going to talk about that later on. Um, there were about 4,000 people working for us in the first six months. About 2,000 professionals from the fire department and other agencies, and about 2,000 volunteers, both from the professional community, German European, uh, we even had people from North America and one lady from Australia who worked for us. Um, and uh, the, the rest was volunteers from Cologne. 
and um, we had to work with an insurance company. Now, I don't know if you have your archive material insured, but in Cologne it was insured by an art insurance company. So they had a very uh, keen interest to find out what actually happened to the material. And uh, of course we had to work together with about 35 colleagues who were more or less traumatized. And of course this changed over time as well. So what uh, did we do? We had to develop standard procedures. Um, we Fortunately we received um, a place where we could set up an emergency treatment center. So we did that. And in that emergency treatment center and on site, we started each day by talking to people and telling them what's our plan, what are we doing, what is your job. But we had to be very careful um, about, it, well, instruction about health and safety, about shift work. There's regulations to that in, in uh, German uh, labor law. Um, of course, we always had to reduce the complexity because you cannot tell people very, or, or cannot instruct them to do very complex procedures. They had to be simple. And the idea was um, have a maximum turnover, get in as much as you can and get it all out again so there will be no bottleneck in between. Um, those 2,000 volunteers who worked for us um, put in 85,000 hours of work, which is quite a lot in those um, 120 days of first treatment. And um, as I already said, there were professionals from all over the place. And we, it took us at, um, three people from our archives plus a number of people from city administration to only to coordinate the volunteers. So it's a lot of work just coordinating. And then to give you an, a, an idea of the simple procedures, um, this is what was done before material was frozen. So anything that was wet, we had this triage system, anything that was wet was uh, prepared. It was rinsed to get most of the dirt out of it. And then it was packaged for freezing. Um, maybe it's interesting for you to know that we came up with this rinsing idea only after colleagues from Prague came up and they said, we had the same problem seven years ago with a big flood and we froze things without rinsing them first. And uh, we got the sort of bricks out of the freezer. So if you, if you want to be sure, make sure you want to rinse them. So we did that. So it's a lot of interaction and contact and network uh, with colleagues. So that was, the, that was the salvage effort and the first emergency treatment effort. Where are we now? Well, we are, um, we've got a sort of step step-by-step step idea, although I must say that most of those steps are happening parallelly. So, of course, we started with salvaging emergency treatment. We then had 20 host archives uh, all across Germany, from the very north to the very south, um, where colleagues had said, well, we've got a few hundred meters of space left. If you want to bring some things, you can. And that's what we did. Um, then we try to register all the items that we found and try to also try to identify them at that stage already. Then any item that we found needs to go into basic conservation because there's such a lot of dust on it, it needs to be cleaned before it's consulted in any way. After that, we have an, another identification phase when archivists look at the, at the item and they try to figure out what it actually is. And after that, it goes to digitization. So that's sort of the ideal world. And I, I put those red brackets around the first three steps because we are more or less finished with them. But then it's uh, 13 years ago, so it's good we finished at least some of that. Um, <clears throat> all the uh, host archives could be cleared or are cleared by now. And in fact, uh, everything has been moved into our new premises in Cologne. I'll show you a picture of that later on. Um, then the registration of all the uh, material that was in the first stage of, um, uh, of salvaging has been finished by the end of last year and we've got about 1.3 million of what we call salvage units. A salvage unit may be one archival unit and maybe more than one and may also be part of one so it's, uh, it's not the same. 
Um, then what we call basic conservation, mainly cleaning, has been done for, with about 17% of the entire uh, amount. With the identification, we are much slower. It's only about 85,000 units so far. And digitization, um, now we're not talking about units, we're talking about images here. Um, we've taken about 7.3 million new images and we have uh, we've um, digitized all our microfilms, so that's another six million images. The civil lawsuits ended in the summer of 2020 with um, a payment to the city of Cologne, which the city of Cologne again used um, to put in a special budget for the reconstruction of the archives, so that's very good for us. And last year we moved into our new building. So let's just look closer at one item, and of course I had to choose something that has uh, um, a bearing on the relations between Cologne and Catalonia. So this is the, uh, the twinning uh, document that was signed in 1984 between Barcelona and Cologne. And it, it was also in the, in the rubble, but it was found again and it was treated. And uh, from our system, now you can tell what happened to it. So it's, it's got a barcode. Any of our items have barcodes now. Um, you can find out when it was first identified, which was in our host archive in Münster in 2012. Uh, you know in which box it was, so maybe it helps for the identification of other documents from the same box. You know where it is now. You know what happened in between. And also in the bottom part, um, you can also see how it went through the further uh, processes, photo documentation, uh, basic conservation, identification. And um, um, of course, life in our archive is not the same as it used to be. Um, we are still a working archive. We are working with the um, city, with the city um, council. I was just wondering, could you, could you turn the the volume down, so I'm, it's, uh, it's easier for me. Thank you. Um, as I said, every item needs special treatment. Um, we have standardized procedures, so it's no longer the archivist taking an item and doing whatever an archivist does with it, or the conservator. We have procedures that need to be followed. We have um, a storage system that does not rely on collections being, you know, side by side, but it's, um, it's a chaotic or a dynamic system. It all relies on the barcodes. Uh, anything needs to be documented. That's why we have this big system that you just saw. Um, and all our processes are coordinated digitally. We have, we're now at about 160 people working in the archive and a lot of them are actually assistants. So it's not professionals but people who've been learning on the job. And uh, we are making starting a lot of projects together with um, academic conservators, also with um, artificial intelligence and those kinds of things. Um, just to give you a very quick overview over some projects, this is um, our freeze drying project. I told you we had about 10% that was found underground in the, in the groundwater. So we froze it in this gigantic freezing house and then had 468 pallet boxes, about three kilometers of material. And it took us about three years, four years, um, to um, freeze dry all of them. We used all facilities for freeze drying of cultural heritage that there were available in Germany. Um, of course, you cannot freeze dry everything. You have to be very careful about photographic material. So um, we had a project together with academic conservators on how to deal with that. And um, to give you an example for an AI artificial intelligence project. We are working um, with a private company to uh, reconstruct pages from all the fragments that we found. So um, we have maybe five, maybe seven million fragments and about 300,000 have already been scanned and it works really, really well. I was so impressed, I could never imagine it. You could put them together virtually and you get the, the pages again. And this is the new building that we moved into in 2021. Um, it's not just us who moved in there, but we are moving together um, with um, a photo archive, city photo archive. And in fact, 
um, we're, we're becoming one institution at some point of time. So um, that's just in the process. So then we'll be about 185 staff in that building. There are 70 people alone working in the paper conservation labs. So it's, um, that's like the big part of the uh, work that we're doing. And uh, the city of Cologne, um, which is otherwise always has, always has trouble with their buildings because they nev they're never finished and they're always much more expensive than they, than they should be. They were so happy because they could finish that on time and in budget. So, uh, but that's the only building in, in Cologne that I know of. So. so what are our lessons learned? Some things have, we've been um, very satisfied with and they've worked very, very well. Uh, communication with city administration, fire brigade, the technical aid agency is on a sort of federal level. And with the social services such as the Red Cross, all of that was really good. Uh, the professional community um, was amazing in their solidarity and I'm very sure that this really kept us going even in the very hard bits in the beginning. Um, also the increase in staff. I would not have thought that it would be so easy, but it was actually, um, it, it, was, it worked very, very well. Uh, psychosocial assistance, monitoring for traumatized people, that, that was available all the time, and they were doing a very, very good job. And also, there were funds and resources available, mainly by the city of Cologne. So that was um, excellent. Some things could have worked much better. Um, the way that professionals on a national level were recruited could have been much better because the way it actually worked out, some of them were not happy, they were not called at the first instance, some of them were not happy, they were called so early on, so there was not a good coordination going on. Maybe there should be national coordination uh, in the case of emergencies. Um, the coordination of offers for help and support, mainly the same thing applies. The archive collapsed, people said, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this, and there was no one to answer them. So that's a, they should have taken more care about that. Um, on the state and on the federal level, we were not quite satisfied with the cooperation, both in terms of money and in terms of help. We could have thought, and there was actually a suggestion that, for example, the military would come in, but the federal um, Ministry of Defense said no. And uh, I've never, up to now, I don't understand why. Um, and uh, something that was not really done properly by the city itself was there was no way that we could actually collect the donations and the finan financial support right at the beginning when it was flowing. People were offering money and there was no way to really collect it. So um, next time, hope it will never happen, but we, we, we'll be better on that. Um, risk assessment is, um, is one item that we've come to learn about and we found out that there are risks, and you all know this, there are risks that you can deal with which do not have a large impact. There are risks which have a large impact but that you can prepare for. And there are risks which have a large impact and they, they are very rare and you can't really prepare. And, um, I was, uh, this, um, um, this image is actually taken from the, um, from the National Archives um, uh, in, in Kew, in London, and uh, they were talking about a plane crashing into their premises. Now, they are right in the, in the flight path of Heathrow Airport, um, but of course, they cannot prepare for that. What can you do? There's no preparation. Um, some things, however, can be planned in advance, and we found out that um, we want to make sure that we know about decision-making uh, processes about structures of communication, who are we talking to, um, who are we not talking to. Um, then general forms of reaction to emergencies, is there a plan for uh, this sort of emergency? And of course we want to do a lot of exercise and training, we've been doing that over the past years. And then the last bit, very complicated, documenting. And documenting also implies documenting which items you have actually found, and this is a bit, big problem. What we cannot plan in advance is we cannot plan for any scenario. So we must be prepared to react also on scenarios that we do not expect. We cannot plan on how individual people will react to stress and trauma. 
And we found out this can be quite different and it can happen at quite some distance in time to the actual trauma. Um, also, we cannot plan for reactions from the public. Um, the Cologne disaster was hugely politicized fairly early on. And of course, this did not help anyone, but it was a, it was a problem. We couldn't deal with that. And uh, cooperation with companies, in that case, you have to know which companies you get for different purposes, and it's very hard to plan that in advance. What, however, we are going to do, or what we are doing, I should say, is we are um, taking a lot of care to be good about prevention. So we are boxing all our material. We're using proper boxes, proper folders. We found out that those items that were properly boxed um, survived the collapse much better than those that were not. So um, we're doing that. We are uh, working on the large format items. We've bought loads and loads of um, those metal drawer chests, plan chests, and they're working very nicely in, a, in the case of an emergency. Um, we are keeping photographic material apart because it always needs special treatment. It, maybe it needs uh, prioritized evacuation as well. Um, we changed the way we're keeping our charters and diplomas. You may remember those fire people carrying those uh, diplomas on, the, uh, on those plastic um, uh, in, in, in those plastic bags, and we're, now we're putting them all in those big, we call them pizza boxes, cardboard boxes, so keeping them in a different way. Um, manuscripts, ledgers, and so on, they're equipped with fitting cardboard, cardboard packaging, and we try not to take any three-dimensional objects into the archive. We don't quite succeed, but we are very good at it now because they have suffered really badly. Um, architects' models, for example, um, they've there's no way we can get them, put them together again. Then we made it a point that we are registering any archival material in a, in a um, database for our storage room. And we are trying to keep that machine readable as well. So when we move things, either in an emergency or just a plain ordinary moving, we always scan the barcodes so we know when which box or which item is moved to which other place. Um, since our collection was insured, um, we make sure now that we know the insurance values of the items when we move them because um, we could not really satisfy the uh, needs of the insurance company after the collapse. So it was a very tough period until they were actually ready to pay. So um, we try to be better at that. Um, we don't accept material into the archive unless it has been appraised before. So we're trying to be very clear about that. And um, we try to keep our information on numbers, figures, amounts um, for collections, for any type of material, for example, black and white, uh, photo negatives, whatever. We try to keep that always available so we can always tell how much we have and where it is stored. Then we have, of course, cataloging, and we found out in the collapse that uh, our cataloging both was not good enough, and of course, not everything was cataloged. Now, I'm looking around. I don't know about what it's like uh, in your archives, but we found out there's actually quite a lot of material in the Cologne archives that was maybe cataloged in the head of some uh, member of staff. But of course, that's not helpful if you're trying to deal with an emergency situation. So. We say cataloging, and we, we try to be um, try to include full descriptions, both of the shape of the item and of the contents. Um, we're marking any item at least once, preferably more often. Now, I don't know. We, I, I know we don't like this, you know, writing with a pencil or you know putting a stamp somewhere, but it's so helpful if if you're losing the order. Um, we use barcodes. I told you that. We suggest foliation. We don't do it for every item, but we try to be good at it. Um, and our objective is keeping archival context even in the case of evacuation, catastrophe, and so on. And then, of course, there's um, digitization, microfilming. People had this very nice idea when they said, oh, you've got all those microfilms. Why do we care about the originals? It's just not the same, and um, we've been Fortunate and very clear, uh, could be very clear about the fact that 
even if we have a digitized image or a microfilm image that we can digitize, it is never a replacement and conservation work always has to be done. It's not an argument against restoration. Um, then there are four points that we think that are most relevant in the case of an emergency and that you can actually think about in advance. Um, of course, the more um, of the material is affected, the more manpower you need. So um, one can think about how to acquire people, professionals, but you should also think about who, could, who would actually be ready and willing to lead a group. It's not, it's not for everyone to work uh, under these circumstances and as a group coordinator it's actually quite tough. Um, maybe you can also think about uh, volunteers. Um, then the other thing that's really important is we needed so much space and we were able to rent this big space in the outskirts of Cologne um, for first treatment but of course we also needed logistics, we needed storage space um, and um, we also needed some quiet areas. We didn't have any offices anymore so we needed some quiet areas where we could actually convene and uh, think about what's, what are the next steps. Then the next thing is uh, networks. Uh, we needed networks with the emergency agencies, uh, with the professional uh, community, but also with our city administration. And they were really, really helpful, I have to say. Um, and then finally, public relations. It's also, some, it's also an, an item or an, an, um, an issue that you don't really spend much time thinking about when you're thinking about emergency situations, but people are so interested. And uh, online media will be covering it from the first minute. And we think it's very important um, to um, find out who can be dealing with that, even in advance. So you don't have to worry about that when the disaster strikes. A little work on professionals in the case of emergency. Um, of course, archivists and conservatives, they are always highly motivated and they are ready to put in long hours in an emergency, sometimes more, more than is good for them, actually. Um, and some of them are always born organizers. They are really good at organizing things. However, archivists and conservatives are experts. And that's not always good. We found out, in particular, if you have German archivists and German conservatives, looking at the processes, they would all have ideas on how to organize that. And of course, it's not helpful if you have a strict process and then you have like uh, the director of a big archive saying, oh no, well, let's organize this differently. It's not helpful, but it, it can happen. Even more interesting, archivists and conservatives, again, this applies to German archivists and German conservatives in our case. They would start to look at things. Um, the president of a large archive um, close to our place, he would be looking at those items and he said, oh wow, this is a letter by Heinrich Sudermann from the 15th century, I didn't know it was around. And he'd start reading it out to the people around. <laughs> it's not a good idea. The same, again, applies to conservatives as well. They would not look into the contents, but they would look at the damage. And they would say, oh, this is so fascinating. I've got green mold here and red mold here. You know? it's, it's not helpful. Um, however, as I said, this only applies to the German community. The people who came from all over the rest, actually it only applies to a very small part of the German community, I should say. But the people who would come in from abroad, of course they'd look at the process and they'd say, okay, what do you want me to do? And then they started working on it. Um, also, um, some other aspects that one might have to think about, those um, professionals, they might want to write on their experience. So you have to talk about what, what they can write about or what you uh, do not want to be publicized at that stage. Um, and they also have influence, of course, on the professional associations. Um, and they may even, with talking about things, um, um, incur consequences for um, judicial processes later on. So it's very hard, but you have to try to keep people to stay calm and not to talk too much about what they're experiencing. Although, of course, it's very exciting. So how did we organize them? We had very international groups, as I said. We, um, they met every morning, and they uh, had instruction at least in two languages. They were instructed in German and English. Sometimes we also tried French. 
Um, I don't know if anybody understood the French we were using. Um, and then, of course, what we, what we did was we color-coded our, our staff. So people would know um, the person with the red shirt, they would be the person in charge. And the people with the green shirts, they would be conservatives. And the people with the blue shirts, they would be other people from Cologne staff who would know their way around. So people from anywhere would know who to ask. This is actually very, very helpful. Um, and then we tried to organize our public relations. We tried to keep it so that um, there would be one time a day when we'd be giving a press conference. And this worked quite well. Uh, some, some recommendations very quickly. I, most of them are already mentioned. So good relations with the fire department seems to me to be very, very important, very, very helpful. Um, also preparing cooperation with the relevant departments in the city administration. So if you're talking about health and safety, for example, uh, very important. Um, then of course drawing an, up an emergency plan. I don't know, we didn't have an emergency plan when our archive collapsed. It wouldn't have helped us anyway, but we didn't have one. So, but I suggest to all of you, uh, think about it. Um, take part in trainings regularly. So it's very good you're having this session here. Uh, it's it's uh, talking and training is actually, I think, very, very helpful. Um, we try to make use of norms and standards because it's much easier to communicate them to other people in the administration. If you say we're doing this according to ISO 11799, then uh, people will say, oh yeah, must be good because it's an ISO standard. Um, we're using electronic means only now for all processes, so the entire, um, entire internal communication um, documentation and so on is complete, completely electronic. And as I said, next time we'll have a system ready to collect donations from the very beginning and we'll have trained staff for PR. One part of the things that we, or one, one consequence um, actually um, only came into fruition nine years after the collapse we, when we started the Emergency Association of Cologne Archives and Libraries. It's 25 archives and libraries in Cologne from very small to fairly big uh, state-run, city-run, university, churches, and so on. Um, and uh, we wanted to improve emergency preparedness. Um, and it actually works very, very well. And we also have a common stock of equipment for emergencies. And we are part of a nationwide group, and we invited all of them around. That's the lower picture with the loads and loads and loads of people who came to Cologne in 2019. And this is part of our equipment, it's actually very new. It was um, built in, uh, in late 2020. It's a container that we use for emergencies. And um, a, a colleague of mine, Nadine Thiel, she was already mentioned, and I, we were in Rio de Janeiro um, at the time shortly after the, the fire in the National Museum. And in fact, the same thing applied there that w happened to us right after the collapse of our building, there was no room available, no dedicated space for first treatment. And we thought, well, why not use um, the, the typical um, infrastructure that is used by a fire, fire brigade and uh, the army and so on, and have one of those containers ready so we can have it brought anywhere where there is an emergency and we can start working right away. And it works for all sorts of catastrophes, flooding, fire, structural failure of buildings. Um, it works for all sorts of material. It's very durable, and as it's not a car, so the car is, is, a, is apart from the container. It can just be transported by car. But we just have to take care of the container. It's uh, very easy to keep up, because you don't have to, have to, um, have to repair it regularly and so on. Um, what can we do inside it? At that point of time when we um, built it first, there's a place for rinsing at the top left area, there's a place for dry cleaning at the uh, top right area, and then um, across the aisle from the rinsing, um, there's a place for using the, the stretch film for uh, freezing, and there's also an area for documentation. Now we found out 
because uh, we had to use it last year, last summer there was disastrous floods in Western Germany and we took it to a place not far away from Cologne and then helped them salvage the city archive in Stolberg, which is a, a town um, about 40 kilometers away. Um, well, we found out we need more space for rinsing, so it's, it's been changed now, it's been adapted to that. And from uh, what I hear, um, there is the intention in Germany of buying about 10 of those containers and placing them strategically around the country. So whenever there is a catastrophe, there would be um, this thing available. And then to finish, finish it off for today, and you've been very, very uh, patient, thank you very much. Um, we have drawn up 10 commandments for ourselves, but I, I put them to you so you maybe you can make use of them or you, you don't, but I, I just don't want to leave without putting them here. Um, the first commandment is that risk management is of course very important, however, it's impossible to have detailed plans for any scenario. Second commandment, much more simple, archive material should be properly boxed. And we pride ourselves in having reached that goal. Um, archive material should be properly stored, and this is very important for photos, maps, and plans. All collections should be registered in a storage database. All archive material should be catalogued thoroughly and right after accession. Archive material should be marked and foliated, Unfortunately, not every item has been foliated in, uh, in our archive. Digitization is he helpful in the case of an emergency. Digitized images are very, very helpful in the case of an emergency. Uh, emergency preparation should be taken seriously, so we try to keep it up every year. We're talking about this in our um, plans. And being a part of powerful networks is also very helpful, not only in the case of emergency, obviously. And finally, 10th commandment, there should be permanent contact with the relief forces. Most importantly, in our case at least, it's the fire brigade. So, multis gracias. And uh, I'm finished. And